Hello. We are going to do now chapter 8 of part 3 of Romano Guardini's book, The Lord. Now, this is, the chapter is entitled Signs. And here he sets the stage that Jesus is preparing uh, uh, and grounding, trying to ground the lives of his disciples in the indestructible so as to prepare them for the coming struggle. So he's, he's trying to, uh, he's teaching them to have faith. And so that's what's going to be the, uh, the theme of this particular um, chapter. The, the Lord's own powers, Guardini says, are mightily concentrated and from his consciousness of the pending ultimate decision, these power, his powers break uh, overwhelming proofs of his omnipotence. There must have been moments when his presence was a terrifying thing. So uh, that's worth pondering, to think about how incredibly different it was when Jesus' presence was revealed to these people that he was close to. There must have been uh, th these moments. It's from this period that St. Matthew reports, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew by boat to a desert place apart. But the crowds heard of it and followed him on foot from the towns. And when he landed, he saw a large crowd, and out of compassion for them, he could cure their sick. Remember that that word compassion in uh, the Koine Greek, spagnizomen, it means a love that comes from the very depths of a person. Love from the very uh, uh, bowels of a person. Uh, is plugged Nixon and uh, I used to describe it to the uh, people in, uh, when I taught high school, love from the guts, you know, and that's the kind of love that Jesus has as he encounters the crowds. Another, remember uh, that other passage where he saw them as harassed and dejected like sheep without a shepherd and he goes out to them in this utter human empathy this compassion it's uh it's really important to see that as the context of all this um and out of compassion for them he cured their sick okay so you see, Jesus is curing the sick is one sign, but another sign here would be his compassion. And the disciples in the middle of all this, and when it's evening, they come to him saying, you know, this is a desert place and the hour is already late. Send the crowds away so that they may uh, go into the village and buy themselves food. But Jesus said to them, they don't need to go away. You yourselves give them some food. They answered him, we have here only five loaves and two fishes. He said to them, bring them here to me. And when he had ordered the crowd to recline on the grass, he took the five loaves and the two fishes and looking up to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds and all ate and were satisfied and they gathered up what was left over 12 baskets full of fragments now the number of those who had eaten was 5,000 men without counting the women and the children so this is a incredible miracle of compassion and abundance. 
From all sides, people have streamed to the man whose name is on every tongue. Their physical un hunger is expressive of their spiritual hunger. Jesus sees both and performs the symbolic act of blessing bread and fish and distributing them, thousands eat their fill and the quantities of food are left over. The meaning of the miracle is clear, says Guardini. It does not consist of the feeding of the crowd. Now, that's interesting. So the meaning is not simply in the feeding of the crowd. From the practical standpoint, those disciples are quite right to suggest that the people go into the surrounding villages and buy food. See, that's, that's how he uh, discerns that the sign is not just about feeding the crowd. No, the feeding of the thousands is, as I said, a revelation of divine abundance. This is the gesture of the active, giving source of divine love. The nourishing of the bodies is just a prefiguration of the sacred nourishment soon to be proclaimed from Capernaum. Now, that's a reference to what we'll see in the next chapter to be the bread of life discourse in John chapter 6. The sacred nourishment is that of Jesus giving his own flesh and blood to eat and drink. Then Jesus withdraws. The, population, the populace is excited. It has interpreted the sign as messianic and insists on making him king. But Jesus will have nothing to do with such kingship or kingdoms. Sending the disciples across the lake, he retires. So now, now we move from that to the next episode. And he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was late, he was there alone. But the boat was in the midst of the sea, buffeted by the waves for the wind was against them. But the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking upon the sea. And they, seeing him walking upon the sea, were greatly alarmed and exclaimed, It is a ghost! And they cried out for fear. Then Jesus immediately spoke to them, saying, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Now, that, 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 I, I uh, notice the great fear when they first get something like an impression of Jesus walking on the water. They, they, he's there, but it's not very visible. They think he's a ghost. That really means, you know, they're not, they're not so clear in their vision. And you'll notice here that they're not clear in their vision because they're afraid. Uh, and this reminds me of that line from uh, Father Hesper. Fear is a very bad counselor, said Father Hesper. And I think that's true. So the, the first thing... Jesus says to them is, take courage. Uh, it is I, do not be afraid. So the uh, take courage, might you could translate that maybe, something like, get hold of yourselves. You know, uh, uh, straighten up and fly right here. Uh, uh, it is I, now, that it is I can be also translated, take courage, I am, okay? So, get a hold of yourselves, recognize the divine presence, I am, okay? 
So, you know, this isn't an ordinary encounter. This isn't a theophany. This is an encounter with the living God. Like Moses encountering the burning bush. But even more clear than that, because this is the divine Son of God. This is Jesus. And he says, take courage, it is I, or in parentheses, I am. Do not be afraid. So he clears the fear, as it were, from the decks of their soul. He clears the fear. But it goes on. But Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, bid me come to you over the water. And Jesus said, he said, come. Then Peter gets out of the boat. He got out of the boat and walked on the water to come to Jesus. But seeing the wind was strong, he was afraid. And as he began to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And Jesus at once stretched forth his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? So it's the, sort of that uh, after the event, after Jesus saves him, there's sort of a moment of, of thinking about what, what's going on here? Why did you doubt? A kind of examination of conscience or consciousness here on the part of Jesus and Peter? I think so. So Guardini gives a, a commentary here and the rest of this chapter is an incredible commentary on faith, the dynamics of faith. And so we should, we should really uh, settle in and listen to Guardini's wisdom here about faith and see if we can pick up on the dynamics of, of the faith uh, uh, encounter that's going on here. The disciples have been caught in a sudden squall and Jesus goes to them walking over the water. He has been praying. And he, uh, Guardini puts in the parentheses here, we can imagine what tremendous consciousness of power and oneness of God must have surged within him after the demonstration of the feeding of the thousands. In other words, you know, uh, in a way, Jesus is on a roll. Uh, and so, you know, he really is concentrated in power. As he prayed, he saw in the spirit the dangers the disciples were in. So he's, he's after taking care of the crowds, he's now going to take care of the disciples. Thus, when the time had come to save them, this is the fullness of time as God sends it, and the time for the men in their extremity, he rose and went to them. So here's Bardini reflecting on time again, okay? So the encounter with Jesus occurs for Gordini in what he calls the fullness of time. And the fullness of time also corresponds to the time of their extreme need. Okay? So wow, this is something else. In other words, are, are, are we in an extreme need of one kind or another? That could be a time that uh, Jesus manifests his fullness, his fullness of time to us. I think that's what Gordini is saying. And then he says something even more remarkable, and I never thought of this. When, you know, we've read these passages since we were young. But Gordini suggests here, perhaps J Jesus did not even notice at a certain point, the coast ended and the water began. So he just kind of lunged out to his disciples and kept walking. That's pretty, uh, you know, 
Uh, again, I've never thought about that scripture passage that way. Uh, and then Gordini's going to back this up with a, uh, uh, a reference to the book of Kings. He says the book of Kings tells how Elias, probably the mightiest of the prophets, after the year-long agony of punitive drought, the mighty proving of uh, the altars and his terrible sentence upon the priests of Baal, flays heaven for water. Long before the least cloud appeared, he says to Ahab, the godless king, go up and eat and drink, for there's a sound of abundance of rain. So he predicts rain before the sky is even um, clouded uh, completely. Isn't that interesting? And then he says, go up and eat and drink. Uh, and he bade his servant announce to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down, lest the rain prevent you. So the king's chariot races homeward in the endless downpour amidst the crashing of thunder and lightning's flares stands Elijah, fixed by the spirit. Then girding himself, he runs before the royal chariot the long way back to uh, Jezreel. The man in the grip of the spirit obeys other laws. He, he must be measured by other than ordinary standards. That's what Gordini is getting at here. Uh, 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 Elias uh, uh, is uh, um, walking to the beat of a different drummer. And the drummer here is the spirit of God. And then this famous like, a commentary from there that a man who follows the Holy Spirit uh, uh, in the grip obeys other laws. He must be measured by other than ordinary standards. Now, and Jesus is even more than that. Notice what Gordini says about Jesus. Jesus is not only visited by the Spirit, like Elijah, he is the Spirit. Okay? What for mortals even for those far advanced in faith, must remain an unspeakable miracle, is for him, but natural expression of his intrinsic being. Business as usual. Um, when Jesus reassures the frightened disciples that it is indeed he and no ghost, Peter says, if it's you, bid me come to you over the water. What do those words reveal? Now, this is important. Now we're into the, I think, the heart of the encounter of faith. So listen carefully. Gordini says here, the desire for proof. And, you know, we admire the boldness of that desire. For if it is a ghost that stands there, the proving will be fatal. Okay? It is also evidence of faith, for Peter does believe. And, and, and finally, it's an example of, listen to this, that great undaunted will to union with Christ, which is the apostle's profoundest trait. Okay, I want to underline that. Peter, according to Guardini, and I, you know, I certainly agree, I think Bordini understands this a lot better than me. You know, I'm just the mouthpiece here for Bordini. But notice what it is that binds Peter really both to us and to Jesus. It's this. It's a great undaunted will to union with Christ. So that's what we all need to cultivate, this undaunted will to be one with Jesus the Messiah, with our Lord Jesus Christ as friend, intimate companion, and Lord of glory. So that's, that's what's going on. And he's, he's got the faith to take risks 
And he even has the faith in the midst of the risk to ask God to show him what to do. So Jesus calls to Peter, come. Peter, his eyes deep in the eyes of the Lord, steps overboard. So he's looking right at Jesus. And again, I'm reminded of the devotion that Teresa Little Flower had to the face of Christ. The, uh, very important. It was a, uh, in fact, it's one of her names. We don't often call, I mean, it, we call St. Teresa by a number of names, right? St. Teresa the Little Flower, of course, that's the name we're familiar with here in South Bend because we have Little Flower Parish. Uh, but it's also Saint Therese of the Child Jesus of the Holy Face. And notice that uh, Guardini highlights this willingness of Peter to gaze on the Lord face to face. See? Um, his eyes deep in the eyes of the Lord. Okay? Um, one of the meditations that we used to do at Notre Dame came from the Curcio. Um, it was called the Three Glances of Christ. And again, it's a meditation where you're drawn right into thinking about the face of Christ. So here, Peter's able to hang on properly and walk on water when he's looking right at the face. And the water bears his weight. He believes. His faith lifts him, says Guardini, to the circuit of that power which flows from Christ. Christ himself does not believe. He simply is who he is, God's Son. To believe means to share not what Christ believes, but what he is. See, that gazing upon Christ's face is to encounter who and what Christ is. Thus, Guardini goes on, Peter participates in this power. He be, he's a part of Jesus' act, okay? But notice what Guardini says here. But all divine action is living action that rises and falls. As long as Peter's gaze holds that of the Master and his faith remains one with the divine will, the water carries him. Then the tension of his trust slackens, consciousness of his human limitations surges in on him, and he recalls the power of the elements, he hears the roar of the wind and feels the waves rock beneath his feet. It is the crisis. The crisis. Instead of leaning more heavily on the support from Jesus' gaze, though, Peter drops his eyes. Uh-oh. Contact with the divine strength is severed. And he starts to sink. All that remains of the fleeting, world-conquering faith is the helpless cry, Lord, save me. Jesus responds, Faint-hearted one, why did you let doubt come near you? The passage contains one of the most important revelations of the nature of faith, says Guardini. And then Guardini's going to review the nature of faith. He's going to explore it. So this, this is a kind of uh, a passage where Guardini is going to say a, what a kind of incomplete understanding of this faith is, and then he's going to give a more complete understanding, just coming attractions, so you, you're ready for what he's going to say here. Okay? 
So he goes on. Attempts have been made to couple the advance of the fervent soul with that made by the intellect, okay? For example, at some specific point in the journey of faith, the intellect bogs down. Realizing its position, it, meaning the intellect, decides that it would be wisest to let revelation pull it out of its quantity, okay? So the intellect is struggling, and it's going to lean into revelation, okay? Um, others have tried to explain faith by the will. So you got the intellect, you've got the will. And here's what he says about the will. The will in search of truth and worth arrives at the end of earthly values, okay? So the intellect uh, bogs down uh, in the journey. The will uh, arrives at the end of its understanding of what's valuable, of earthly values. Concluding that where these leave off, eternal values must begin, it accepts the tidings of them from the Word of God. Okay? So the will is struggling and says, gee, there must be more to the drives of my desire than just this uh, worldly value, even a good value, right? And so beyond the value, the will um, uh, uh, accepts the tidings of eternal values, okay? And Bardini says, look, there's much truth in this, but for Guardini, it misses the central truth. The central truth lies elsewhere. For catch this, what the believing soul experiences is not just a truth or a, a value, but a reality. Okay? And the reality and Guardini continues, which, he answers, the reality of God in the, the living Christ. Only now, in the midst of everything that man may think or experience, in the midst of all that is known as world, rises a point that does not belong to the world. More real than the world. Faith is the act of seizing this reality, of building one's life on it, of becoming part of it. That's not an easy thing to do. The life of faith, Bordini continues, demands a revolution in our sense of reality. In our consciousness, Bordini continues, which is not only entangled but completely befuddled by the world. The body is more real than the soul, electricity more real than thought, power more real than love, utility more real than truth. Together they form the world in this sense, okay? incomparably more real to us in our normal life than God. That's what he's saying. How difficult it is, even in prayer, to sense the reality of God, Cordini continues, and how seldom given us, he continues, the grace of contemplation in which Christ is more tangibly, powerfully present than the things of existence, and then to rise, to mix with people, to perform the duties of the day, feel the tug of environment in public life, and still to say, God is more real than all this? Christ more powerful? To say this spontaneously, absolutely convinced that it is so? Gordini asks a good question here. How many can do this? This is almost an, 
a tone of incredulity here on the part of Gordini. And, and I, I think we can stop at that and ponder that a little bit. How many can? How do we get there? That's the question. So here's how Gordini phrase, begins the effort at the answer. Okay? He says, living in faith, working in faith, practicing faith, that is what counts. Daily, earnest exercise of faith is what alters our sense of reality. Now, and then, then he, he comes right back at the question that somebody might raise. And the, uh, this, uh, th this is really interesting. He says, experience of genuine reality must be our aim. Okay? We're not talking about pie in the sky, by and by. It's, it's the experience of genuine reality, Guardini reassures us. Um, that must be our aim. But, uh, Guardini allows an objection to come up here. But that is auto-suggestion, someone suggest, objects. And Guardini goes on, he says, to this, that is this objection, there's not much that can be said, little more than you say that because you stand outside the experience. It's true that in the reforming of the consciousness, all means of self-renewal are effective. I mean, I'd use this example as somebody who's lost a lot of weight recently. That's an effort at self-renewal. Uh, uh, and of course, I see it personally as a man of faith that it's part of it is I'm, I'm trying to cooperate with wisdom or with the wisdom of faith. But, you know, uh, reforming my consciousness about how to eat and how to exercise, you know, uh, are, are, that's just reforming my consciousness. It's a means of self-renewal, and it can be accomplished by auto-suggestion on the human level. That I mean, Gordini's not uh, denying auto-suggestion, but he's, he's going to say and remind us that the realm of faith is distinct, okay? He says this, Nevertheless, it is not so much the technique that counts when you're dealing with faith, right? As the actual result of that renewal. Enter into faith, he says, and you will see clearly what it is we are striving for. And you will no longer talk of auto-suggestion, but of the service of faith. And, he adds, it's bitterly needed daily exercise. So, could I, I just continue with this example? Just as I need, if I'm going to continue my lifestyle change, and continue to lose weight, I, I bitterly need to daily attend to those physical things. Even more so, I have to open myself in the spiritual realm to what we as a church, we as a people of God are striving for. And that is the service of faith. So, you know, it happens in, you know, many ways, many manifold ways. But you can see that uh, you have to stay faithful to the exercises. I think, you know, I think prayer every day is important. Uh, I think uh, reading spiritual, uh, solid spiritual material is important. Uh, I think... Uh, some level of wise fellowship is important. These are all what we might call exercises of faith. And Gordini says in the last paragraph of this chapter, such exercises are not easy. And he reminds us again, those are rare hours in which I is lost in I, meaning where we're face to face with Christ in our life of faith like we were talking about before, when Peter was gazing at Jesus face to face, 
and he could walk on water. He says those are rare hours. And the circuit of power looping between God and man is complete in those hours. He says, however, usually, and this is very real, Guardini says to us, usually our unrest is stronger than Christ's paling features. In other words, we're so restless inside that we, we can barely see Christ. He has paling features, like when they cried out, it's a ghost, right? <clears throat> he goes on. Usually the water does not seem to bear our weight. In other words, and Christ's word that it does sounds like pious symbolism. That, that's really remarkable. In other words, uh, we're, we're trying to read scripture and all we feel like, oh, that's just pious symbolism. Guardini continues, however. He says, what happened to Peter in that hour happens daily in every Christian life. For to count for nothing the things of the, the world holds dear, and for all important what the world counts for nothing, simply on the word of Christ, to be contradicted again and again by those around us and by our own hearts. So <laughs> when you're in that storm, everything that people are saying to you is going to contradict what Christ is trying to say to you, and then your own heart is too. I mean, that's, that's what Gordini is saying. That's, and that's very real in a crisis of faith. That's very real. Um, yet, we make this choice to love, to love God. And remember the, the principle that you always have the choice to love. And we do have the choice to stand fast. Guardini reminds us, that is no easier than Peter walking on the water. Let's pray for that kind of faith, uh, that we could pray for the gift of that kind of faith. And I hope that Guardini has helped us here. Thank you very much.